Uh, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you're joining us from today. Welcome to this iStruxy panel discussion around the theme of persuasion and collaboration. Uh, my name is Will Arnold. I'll be chairing the discussion today. So this discussion is one of three discussion webinars taking place today as we celebrate what would have been the date for the Structural Awards 2020. Uh, as you probably know, the awards were postponed this year due to the pandemic, uh, but we hope that you enjoy these thought-provoking alternatives instead. This is the first discussion of the day, and I'll put up a reminder in an hour's time at the end of the session to highlight the other two events. This morning's panel discussion focuses on how structural engineers can influence decision making. How can we be persuasive in communicating our ideas? How do we help others understand our point of view? How do we learn these skills, and how do we get ourselves into the right position to be able to practice them? And how do persuasion and collaboration go hand in hand, being sure that we also listen and understand the view of others? in order to nourish the best ideas and create a better world for future generations. And of course, I couldn't uh, resist the opportunity to also ask the panelists how they see this all connecting back to the most challenging topic of today. How do we persuade others to act, to do things differently, to test our new models of thinking in order to respond to the climate emergency? How are we gonna persuade those around us to join in the fight <coughs> to do something about this at a time when it matters most? I'm really excited to be joined today by uh, three inspirational figures from the world of engineering and design. In a minute, each of our three panelists are going to take about a minute or so each to share with you their initial thoughts on persuasion and collaboration. But of course, before we kick that off, I should probably introduce you to each of them and tell you a little bit about who they are. Um, Elena Rodriguez Falcon is the President and Chief Executive Officer at the New Model Institute in Technology and Engineering in Hereford. She's also a principal fellow at the Higher Education Academy, and she's a fellow of the Institution of Engineering and Technology. Uh, I think it's fair to say she's well regarded as a disruptor and an agent for change in the world of engineering education. So I'm sure you'll be inspired to hear her views on the role of education in developing our communication skills today. Roma Agrawal is a structural engineer well known for her work on the engineering design of the Shard here in London, as well as her work as an author and a tireless advocate for people underrepresented in the engineering profession. Roma attributes her enthusiasm for engineering to her love of making and breaking things, cultivated by playing with Lego as a child, something which I certainly relate to and I imagine you potentially do too. Uh, in 2018, Roma was awarded an MBE for her services to engineering, and so we're really grateful to have her join us today. Finally, Martin Knight is the founding director of Knight Architects, an architectural studio recognized for its design of bridges and infrastructure. He's a passionate advocate for design quality, and he believes that transformational leadership is gonna be needed if we're gonna increase the positive impact infrastructure has on our daily lives, as well as addressing the contribution made by infrastructure to climate breakdown and biodiversity loss. So like I say, hopefully we'll talk about persuasion and collaboration around this topic at some point today. Right, that's enough from me for a minute. Um, I'm gonna hand over to our panelists one at a time and they're gonna give you a brief introduction to their thoughts around persuasion and collaboration. I believe up first we have Elena. Uh, thank you, Will. In Alice in Wonderland, Alice asks the Cheshire Cat, would you tell me please which way I ought to go from here? That depends a good deal on where you want to get to, said the cat. I don't much care where, said Alice then it doesn't matter which way you go, said the cat. You see, Alice and the cat had a conversation that took Alice nowhere specific. She didn't know what she wanted or didn't care. The cat had an opportunity to influence Alice's choices, but chose not to or didn't know how to. If educators were the cats of Alice's story, would we have the responsibility to show our Alice's a way or give them the tools to reach the decision themselves? If the cat is our future engineer though, should we be training him or her to persuade their stakeholders on the direction that they should choose, or better even, to walk the pathway the cat engineered and built, just to extend the metaphor a bit? My position on this is that we ought to educate engineering students to have the skill to communicate credible, clear, logical, and ethical arguments, not just technical, and either show or build a way for analysis of this world. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. Fantastic analogy, love it. Uh, Roma. Hi there, thanks so much for having me. So um, this year has been quite a tumultuous one, to say the least, quite chaotic. 
Um, I've been reflecting a lot on the Black Lives Matter movement, for one. Um, and I think my biggest takeaway from this year is that we need to stop trying to change us as individuals and kind of work on the system. And what my what I mean by this is, you know, I entered the engineering profession. I am a woman, I'm an immigrant, I'm a woman of color. And I came in and into this country and people thought I was quite loud, quite blunt, quite opinionated. And that's probably exacerbated by the fact that I am in a min minority compared to other engineers around the table. Most of the meetings I still attend are, you know, purely men, white men and me. And what I would like to talk about is how do we create the atmosphere or the environment within which anyone, no matter what their status is, no matter what their strengths are, their skills are, can be put in the position so that they would be listened to, so that they're allowed to influence and persuade people. Um, and that is that is really the key for me, is how do, how do we create that environment? And I'm sure that's something that we will talk about more. Thank you. Thank you very much. Couldn't agree with you more. Looking forward to hearing more about that. Uh, finally, Martin. Uh, thank you, Will. Uh, good morning. Um, so I, I'm different to most of the rest of the people on the panel and probably in the audience that I'm an architect and I'm an architect in a world of engineers. Um, Knight Architects designs bridges, uh, which are obviously engineering structures. And so we have to be both persuasive and collaborative to achieve the successes we aspire to. Uh, for our clients, for society now and for the future, and also for ourselves. Uh, this image um, is the Coolston family driving their flock of sheep across our new Pooley Bridge in Cumbria. Um, and this was to celebrate its opening last week. Um, the image also uh, illustrates perfectly uh, the art of calm persuasion and professional collaboration. Uh, none of the sheep uh, disappeared. And so for architects and engineers, or rather for engineers and architects, um, projects often have complex and diverse goals, but we can all appreciate the simplicity of this challenge in this bridge, um, which for these users and their community was simply to get to the other side. And I think we can learn a lot from this kind of simplicity. Thank you, Martin. Okay, so... Uh, I am going to stop sharing my screen so that you can all see us as well as being able to hear us. Hopefully that's worked seamlessly. Um, and we will lead into uh, a bit of an open discussion on, on what you've just heard and, and much more. So I'd like to start by posing the question about education, because um, I think we should start at the beginning with all of this. Um, so I guess the question is, how do we learn to persuade? Uh, you know, the difference between education and the real world, how do we prepare engineers to collaborate with non-engineers, and maybe how the difference is come out between engineering education and the education of other disciplines. Um, and I think it would be very natural to maybe hand over to Elena first to share with us her thoughts on that. Uh, thank you, Will. And um, I'm really excited to be here today talking uh, about this topic. So I, I suppose um, that, that the first natural answer is that we learn to persuade from childhood. Uh, I was reflecting on this uh, as we've been preparing for, for the session. Uh, you, you ask for Christmas presents and you try to persuade Santa that you've been a good kid you trade at school with other other children pokemon cards i like pokemon uh, <laughs> however as as we train formally uh, we learn to use data that we gather through the design methodology in in, in the case of engineers to persuade and present the, the solutions uh, normally via technical reports uh, However, educating to persuade requires, in my opinion, learning opportunities that are real, that are authentic, so that we can help our students develop those logical arguments that I was talking about earlier, that can be com communicated simply and succinctly to real audiences. So to do that, uh, we, we really need to provide that kind of environment uh, in, in higher education. And the, the organization that I'm leading uh, to create at the moment, a new higher education institution, uh, that's what we are uh, aiming to do. Bring the real world into the learning space and take the learning into the real world, where context is key. And therefore, working with people from other sectors, from other disciplines, 
is essential in uh, an, an understanding the needs of stakeholders is fundamental to, to uh, complete that training and to be able to persuade effectively. Roma, do you, do you have anything to add? Maybe, I don't know, do you want to reflect on what happened when you finished education and went out into the real world in the context of what Elena is saying? I mean, so one of the things to say is that I actually have a degree in physics and then did a master's in structural engineering. Um, and I, I would say, it, so, you know, we're going back um, 15 years now since I graduated. Um, and my, my master's was very, very technical. So yes, we did some projects, but the projects we did were all between structural engineers. And I, am, I know that a lot of universities, maybe not all of them, have moved on from that model of teaching. And I think that's extremely important. And from an education point of view, one thing that I really do think is, is missing from a lot of courses, I'm not gonna say again, everyone, are stories. So when I was researching my book Built, I, you know, I was writing about how forces work and how structures work, and, and that was all great. But I suddenly started um, discovering the stories of engineers like Fazlur Khan or like Emily Roebling or Joseph Bazalgette, and we had never studied or I've never heard any of these names throughout my education. And somehow it really humanized engineering for me to hear the stories of actual human beings behind the structures. So I think that's something that I would like to see a lot more of. Um, and on that topic, it's important that the stories that we do teach and that we do share are not just focused on a sort of white Western perspective, because it's very easy to fall into this narrative that the Industrial Revolution was in the West and all the development happened here and all the innovation happened on this side of the world. But, you know, it's simply not true. And I think it would make for a much richer educational experience to have all of these very global perspectives included. Yeah, no, really good point. I, I, I'm totally with you on stories as well. I think, you know, for me, Emily Rosling's like perhaps, you know, one of my favorite bridge engineering stories of all time. Um, and that's, you know, effectively saved the day on what is now one of the most famous bridges in the world. Um, yeah, great. Uh, Martin, how... how do you, do you sort of, is it obvious to you in your work, the, the differences between engineering education and architectural education? Like when we turn up to your office, it, does that just come through from day one? Well, I, I should make the point to begin with that I come to your office. So that's the, yeah. uh, that's, <laughs> that's, the that's the way it works. Um, no, I, I, I think in all honesty, I don't know enough about engineering education and, and probably now uh, about architectural education uh, it's been rather a long time but there there is always this uh, perception that um, oh, architects are the great communicators because uh, we're, we're, we're taught to stand up and defend our designs in crits and, and somehow that gives us this superpower that is denied to engineers and I think actually uh, that, that that's an easy trope and one that is um, is kind of misleading and encourages um, difference and defensiveness um, sometimes. And uh, I, I think it's worth sort of exploring that more deeply. Um, and Elena picked up on it. I think that, that engineering education uh, very often, uh, it seems to me, can encourage uh, a focus on objective or technical aspects rather than subjective and, and emotional aspects. And um, the in, in the search for the answer the, the 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 one and the the only solution and because of that and because of the lack of nuance in um a, a calculation it means that it's very difficult then to have a subjective discussion and to be persuasive it's very difficult to persuade with um i mean you, arguments are typically made and 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 won uh, with with emotional and subjective points of view, and then supported with facts. Uh, you, you don't win an argument with facts and then back it up with an emotional um, scenario. So I, I, I think the the the, the well-rounded education involves um, much more than the search for for sort of accuracy and facts. Uh, and in fact, I, I, I encourage um, uh, accurate guessing. I think an, an accurate guess is much more um, time efficient and, and kind of confidence boosting if you get near to the right answer than uh, laboring away at a, a, at a, a calculation for, for weeks at end. Yeah, brilliant. Elena, do you want to respond to any of that? 
Uh, no, I, I, you know, I, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I was thinking about what Martin was saying and and the way architects learn uh, that educational environment uh, is is much more uh, attuned to the real world. Uh, you have an environment where you are, uh, you have a a, a a community project, and you bring it to the classroom to train your archi architects, and that's why you you get that social learning that is much more powerful than in in typical engineering settings so i, I think i think we we are um, we should all be learning uh, how uh, in in terms of how architects learn medics learn because they have the opportunity to deal with with real uh, situations and if you really deal with real situations you have the ethical uh, responsibility the professional responsibility to respond with um, powerful and, um, and and good solutions uh, and if you have that if you have a powerful good solution then you can persuade your customers and you, you talked to Elena in your intro about the cat uh, you know be, being the, the the wayfinder or leading the way and, or maybe answering well if you don't know where you're going does it matter I mean do you see the role of educators more along the lines of te you know teaching young engineers how to do things or is this about allowing them to get it wrong themselves and forge their own paths oh no I, I, I passionately believe in in uh, providing an environment where you learn to fail and, and and fail fast and and be comfortable that failure is actually the best learning experience um i, I think uh, unfortunately traditional education has trained us uh, in through through the way we are examined uh, to try to get it right every time and martin was alluding to that with that one solution there isn't one single solution to problems and particularly the problems of this world and and if we uh, continue to to, to train our future engineers with, with that mentality, uh, we are not going to find the, the answer to climate change like uh, you, you were alluding to earlier. So I, I think learning to, to, to fail and learning to learn are the two most powerful tools that we educators need to use. Yeah, yeah, I agree. R Roma, do, like, does any of this sort of feed into your, your point about uh, helping others to persuade and putting others in, an, in, a, in a position where they, they can influence. I mean, I often feel sometimes with graduates, they're worried they're going to get it wrong or they're going to say the wrong thing. They're going to show up the firm. Uh, how, do we, how, do we, how do we overcome things like that? How do we do the best we can to put people in that position where they can start to get things wrong? Um, I, I think that's a great question. So I think number one is to, you know, I talked about creating that the right atmosphere and the right environment for somebody. And that needs to start in, you know, the, the employer. So if I'm a graduate, I've joined a company, I want to be able to see through my, my boss, my colleagues, the other people on my team, that internally we are you know, floating all kinds of maybe bonkers ideas, but you know, we're being creative and passionate about things. And yeah, we're getting things wrong, but we're doing that in a collaborative way and you know, poking holes in each other's statements. Um, I think there's a bit of disconnection that we need to bring in so that we can very freely and openly critique an idea. That doesn't mean be rude about it, but it means we should be able to critique an idea for the idea itself, rather than if I, you know, if I float something and Martin says, oh, you know, can you see all these things that are wrong with it? And I say, yeah, let's talk about the idea and not take it personally and not think that that's a reflection on me and my skills. Um, and that requires confidence. Um, so again, I kind of come back to the employers themselves, so you know, all the people in the audience today who are line managing people who own their own practices, should be really thinking about how do I create an atmosphere in which everyone is really comfortable and really can just be themselves. Yeah, no, really, really good point. Martin, how does that, I mean, what works well for you in, in the design environment on this topic? Um, per personally, being there at the beginning of the discussion um, and having everyone uh, who, who's likely to influence a project being being available at the outset so that shared objectives um, are, are sort of seeded in a project very early on. And 
then everyone doesn't have to be participant all the way through, but they, they understand what the shared objective was and they can see the direction of travel as, as they come back to uh, and return to a project. And there is a, there's a real uh, danger that there's sort of um, the strong mm -hmm. sense of authorship or personal um, investment in a project um, means that some, somebody cannot change their view and they cannot pivot towards a, a better solution that, that somebody brings in. But equally, you, you need to um, converge ultimately on, on the right solution. Um, I, I, I do think the um, providing, as an employer, providing a, an environment that is... Um, comfortable and um, encourages people to uh, express themselves and to come up with ideas and not to feel that they may say the wrong thing is really important. And in all honesty, um, certainly my practice does that and almost everybody we work with does that. I, I think generally we're quite good at it. But where it, where it tends to fail is over time uh, and uh, uh, and how, how that kind of... Um, encouragement is is maintained o over time and the 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 most obvious threat uh, right now um and probably for for the significant uh, future and possibly forever will be how we transfer uh the the sort of environment of a studio a design studio uh into um a a collaborative working environment online which uh, allows still that kind of um, familiarity with each other, the, the ability to, to sort of casually ask questions and to learn by, learn by hearing, learn by overlooking, that, that kind of um, osmosis of, of learning, um, of being part of a, a team is really important. And uh, the, the tools that we have to, to, to collaborate online um, whether team, Zoom, Workcast, whatever it happens to be, um, have proven to be incredibly powerful and very, very quickly taken up. But they're still in their infancy and we're not really um, yet able to uh, re replicate that sort of environment of, of kind of immersive learning and, and, and support that um, being physically in a studio provides. Yeah, yeah. I, I, so um, just to go back for a second, so you, you mentioned, you know, that in your practice, and I think I share this with, with those who work around me, I feel like the environment I work in is fairly inclusive and sets people up to, you know, be okay with saying the wrong thing and learning from each other. But it, but it does strike me that maybe, you know, it's easier to convince ourselves of that than it is, than it is to convince ourselves that there's room for improvement. So, you know, if you were to offer advice to people listening on, uh, you know, maybe they're questioning how well it's, this is working now that they are doing everything electronically, everything's remote, they're trying to still set up their young graduates to ask the right questions and, you know, and, and not be afraid of failure. Where, do you have any sort of tips for people to try and, you know, test the waters with themselves to see how well they're doing in, in terms of that open inclusive environment or any thoughts on that? Um, I, I can start, but I might take a, you know, a little step further back um, before I, looking at your question. Yeah. Which is, I think, one of the biggest problems today is is people's humility, frankly. And it's, it's the ability for us to admit to ourselves that we're wrong, to admit publicly that we could be wrong, mm -hmm. and to admit to ourselves and publicly that we can change our minds. And at the moment, it feels like, you know, and I'm talking from a kind of big political worldview type of situation, that this is a very difficult thing. People become entrenched in a particular position, and then it, it becomes like a failure if they've changed their mind or, you know, decided something's wrong. So, so that word humility has been a big one for me this year. And it's about leaders sitting down with people from all different backgrounds and denominations and really actually listening and really saying, I want to learn, I want to be better, and there are points of view which are different than mine that are correct and that are valid, and giving those due volume. Um, you know, as a woman of color, I've, I've also been one of the youngest people on my teams in general. I've worked for three different companies during my career. I'm currently self-employed. Um, I have been in countless situations where I feel that what I'm saying or the perspective I'm offering or the voice that I'm using is not very welcome in the room. 
And that might make people feel defensive in the audience right now. But that's how I feel. And I would love for people to have the humility to say, you know what, I want to know how I can make Roma and other people like her and all the different people like her feel that they can be themselves in this industry. Yeah, yeah. I, I've, I, I've read a couple of books recently that, that talk a lot about us and them and trying to sort of get rid of it. And most recently, I read a book called Factfulness, which is a, a really, it's quite an uplifting book because I think the subtitle is something like 10 Reasons Why You're Wrong About the World and Why Everything's Going to Be Okay. <laughs> and it talks a lot about how humans have a natural tendency to be tribal. There's us and there's them. And when it comes to ideas, there's our ideas or my ideas and your ideas. And so people's natural attachment often is to, well, say, well, that's my idea. I should defend it and keep defending it. And, you know, to, to then admit that actually maybe their idea is, is better or more advantageous or better aligned with the client's aspirations can take quite a lot of courage, I think, to get, get into that, get into that practice. Um, Just to maybe add on that, I think that doing that actually establishes a level of credibility because what it shows is that as a designer or an engineer, you are open to ideas, you are open to listening. And, and then added to that, if, if you simply just do what you say you were gonna do, deliver on time and so on, if you can create that kind of honest, authentic relationship and people see you for who you are, which is every single one of us is a flawed human being, and we all have ideas which can be improved. And if, if we can be humble and accept that and we can project that to other people, I think that that builds a huge level of trust which then feeds into this whole idea of persuasion and collaboration. It's much easier for somebody mm. to believe me for ideas number three, four, and five if they trust me. Mm. Mm. Uh, Elena, do you do you do you want to do you have any thoughts as to how you teach this? I mean, this is so hard, isn't it? You you get young mm -hmm. bright people start at university. They might have just gone through twelve years of being told that there's a right answer and a wrong answer in maths and in physics. How do you take that and then? convince them that it's okay to be wrong, that they should be trying to find out if they're wrong and searching for the best answer. Where, where do you start, Elena? I think you start with with um, with the individual, uh, Will. I, I was listening carefully to what Roma was saying and emphasizing in, in, in so, so much uh, uh, about her experiences. And yet yesterday uh, at NMIT, we, we had a, a whole staff session about uh, EDI, equality, diversity, and inclusion. And someone asked a question, how do we know when we are inclusive? And, and it's a very powerful question because it really it comes to uh, that, that answer when, when I feel like I'm, I can be myself. And if you, uh, if you have a, an environment, an, a, a learning environment where individuals can be them, themselves, whoever they are, whatever characteristics they bring with themselves, uh, that, that then uh, should convert into uh, an environment where uh, we can express our views, we can uh, make mistakes, uh, where we can learn from them, those mistakes. But in as answer to your specific question, um, my, my, my belief is that uh, if we have a very um, rigid uh, program, educational program, where you have uh, structured every single step of the way uh, in such a way that there is no room for maneuvering, then it's very difficult to to create an engineer that doesn't think that way. If in, if in on the other hand, what you structure is a, a loose, organic, uh, problem, uh, open and ill structure, problem solving type of environment, what you create is a, a future engineer that can think in those terms. But uh, equally important, if you bring then elements of, of other disciplines, of other uh, contextual um, situations that are happening around the world and embed those within the learning experience, what you have is indeed uh, an environment where you are going to make mistakes no matter what. Uh, and it's how safe you make the learner feel uh, that then uh, that makes the difference, and and I think that's what that I'm I'm super keen that that's what we are going to provide at MIT. Yeah, th thanks. Do, do do you? I mean, I know that from a personal perspective, when I went to university, I wanted to be taught what the right answer was. You know, I I chose engineering because I wanted to learn how to make things stand up. 
um, and to leave behind something, uh, you know, in this world. Uh, how how do you approach th those students who maybe you know come to university to be taught? So they feel like they're ready to be taught how to do things. How do you then marry that up with this idea of actually this is as much about them forging their own path as anything else? I, I, I go back to the same um, answer I gave you before. Um, you you have to present um, learners with open-ended questions. Uh, if you give uh, close questions where there is a yes or a no answer, then that's what you train the engineer to, to encounter. But life is not like that. Uh, and, and, and that's why bringing employers like Martin, like others into, into learning experiences where they have their own criteria, their own expectations, where they have uh, restrictions like financial restrictions, when you have uh, ethical considerations, whether uh, your answer might end up killing people, for example, the bridge is going to fall apart if, uh, if you don't think of various uh, of various uh, considerations. Uh, you, I, I, I do believe that um, ultimately you have to reach an optimal answer, uh, but that optimal answer can take different shapes. And if you have, for example, different groups coming up with, with different answers, and, and that's why project-based learning is so important, um, then you can demonstrate to each one of those learners that you can reach uh, an optimal conclusion that actually can take different shapes. Um, Martin, um, I, I'm quite interested to keep going on this, this idea of being wrong and discovering if we're wrong. And of course, you can critique other people uh, quite easily. But I, th I find what's really hard is to critique yourself. Um, <laughs> and the, well, the best architects I think of are very good at that. So how do you go about doing that as an architectural team? Well, I, I think in a way it, it, it's looking or it's picking up on the point that uh, Roman made about humility. Um, and, and one way to interpret that is to, to see yourself as others see you. And um, nowadays we are we, we are actually we're all in the world of broadcast media. Um, everything we're, we're talking about and everything we're doing is via a screen and a camera. So um, to a certain extent, that means our behaviors have to change, but it also gives us the opportunity to see how we come across and to hear our voices. And um, the, uh, the, 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 the painfulness of, of listening to yourself and watching yourself is really, really powerful. It's really educational. And um, that is a way that um, we can uh, get better at, at uh, communicating and, and persuasion is fundamentally a, 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 a communication tool. So um, I, I think that's, um, that, that, that is an opportunity. Um, I think uh, certainly speaking uh, again as the architect in the, in the world of engineers and um, therefore we, we, we really have to sing for our supper in, in most circumstances because we're, we're, we're often not seen as essential to the project. Um, my, my view is that sort of, um, e even though we are different, I, I pick up on the, the um, quite often we, we're on international projects, we work with a local architect. So in, in that instance, rather than competing with them, we team with them and together we're stronger. Um, similarly, with uh, working with engineers on uh, bridge projects, on infrastructure projects, um, the, uh, the, 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 the notion that there's more that unites us than divides us is also really, really powerful. And these are, these are simple um, uh, kind of messaging uh, that often come from the world of politics or the world of society and not from our profession um, that actually allow or enable uh, a much broader conversation to take place. Mm, yeah. I'm talking yeah. about bringing in society, I'm just going to wave this book at you. It's called Resonate um, by Nancy Duarte. And I actually came across this during one of my employments. And this was the book that was used to teach me presentation skills. And it's, it's just an incredible book to look at because she breaks down the stories of Star Wars, and she breaks down speeches by Martin Luther King Jr. and all these amazing speeches. 
and explains to you how to use emotions. That thing that Martin was talking about at the beginning of the seminar. How do we use emotion to communicate? How do we tell a story? What 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 is our actual human reaction to listening to the different speeches? Who who do we think is persuasive as a speaker of the different leaders that we listen to? And I think having that period of reflection of actually you know listening to other people that we think are good and trying to then analyze why we think they're good. Um, and then a bit of study, in fact, um, on how, how, you know, breaking these down and what the science behind these kinds of speeches are, um, will allow you to learn a skill. Because I fundamentally believe that the art of persuasion, communication, presenting is a skill that you can learn. Yes, some people, it might be more innate to them and it might be less innate to others, but it's a skill that you can learn. So, so, we, so we should probably talk about that because I, th I think actually we might spend the last 15 minutes mostly discussing sort of uh, critiquing ourselves and try, trying to work out if we've got the answers right or wrong. I'd be really keen to hear a bit more about then communicating ideas to others and persuading others that, that you know, that our idea does have merits when maybe they don't, that they maybe don't see it like that to start with. Uh, I don't know, Roman, do you want to, do you want to start off with your thoughts on that, building on the book that you just uh, flashed up to us? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, I mean, I could go on about this for hours, but I think we need to really think about stories and characters, okay? So you might think, oh, we, we work in construction. Um, we talk about bridges and buildings. How do we have a story and a character? So when I wrote my book, I tried to make concrete a character. I gave concrete texture, sound, a voice, um, a personality, different types of personalities. Um, and I think what I've learned from that book is that anything can be a story or a character. Um, so that's one thing that I think engineers can really think about is how do you kind of give personality and character to the ideas that you're trying to communicate? Um, and then the second one is about using a common language. I think engineers very quickly and easily, and I still do, to do this till today, even though I regularly present to five-year-olds about engineering, we slip into jargon. We start using words that nobody outside engineering understands. Um, and we have to check ourselves. Again, it's about having the humility to say that person is not stupid or ill-educated for not knowing this language. It's my fault. I'm the one who's wrong to be using that language in the first place. So I need to break that down um, and communicate more clearly. Um, and I think one of the biggest, if I'm talking really practically, one of the biggest tools at our disposal is a pen and paper. So it's, it's drawing, it's sketching. So this is how I plan... Um, my book chapters and this is what i send to my editors and agents to say you know what do you think of this structure and that is so easy for them to pick up and kind of get a feel for what my structure is there is this hard science in that as well but it gives them an idea um and i think talking about our industry if we can get a big sheet of paper out and then get a pen and paper and scribble over stuff and now we need to obviously find out a way to do that virtually but i think that can be a really powerful tool in, in bringing ideas together Martin, do you want to add, add, add anything about your, your approach to persuasion, your approach to selling the story? Uh, yeah. I mean, the, the, and again, it comes down, I think, to the complementary differences between engineers and architects. Um, engineers seem to me to be uh, either naturally drawn to or educated towards problem solving. Um, and, and certainly in the, in, in the world of business that that that's very evident in the roles that we are given um, but that encourages a uh, a mindset of uh, solving the questions what and how so what's the solution how do we build it and those are very reductive questions that they're, 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 they're zooming in to find the one answer architects by contrast and, and we we really encourage this um, seek answers to the questions why and who so why is this project necessary? Who's it going to affect? And those are those are sort of open questions that they, they encourage um, uh, examination, they encourage exploration. They don't actually have finite answers. And so long as those two sets of questions um, coexist and and can flow. Um, one to another to another, then you know that you're going to end up with a solution that addresses the 
the original goal in the best possible way. So you will you will fulfill the why, you will address the who, uh, and you will achieve the what and the how. And um, unfortunately, that that kind of interrogation of a project right at the beginning, quite often set by a uh, political context or political ambition for a project, leaps very quickly uh, over the, 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 the why and the who towards the what. People want to see the, the, the graphic visualization, the, the fly through and so on. They want to demonstrate that long before anyone knows actually um, what, 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 what are the soil conditions. Uh, do we really want to be designing for uh, six lanes of traffic? Uh, do we need that in in twenty years' time? Do we need it in two years' time? So the um, those questions are, are not sometimes given the uh, prominence and, and the and the oxygen that is necessary to make sure that the end product is uh, is is the right one. Yeah, I, I like that. It, it strikes me that your why questions and your who questions that that's all about understanding rather than answering, isn't it? It's trying to work out what the real question is behind the question. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and actually, I mean, one of the greatest things that um, we are um, often denied in the project, but one of the greatest things in a project success is time, and it's time to, to think on it. Um, uh, HS2, in their design vision, uh, set out nine really important principles, and one of those was give time to design. And I think it's a really, really important one. We, we slightly sort of... Um, uh flippantly but we of, often talk about the time that you put the project under the pillow and sleep on it is is, is as important as the time spent laboring in front of a screen or a, uh, at a desk you have to let uh, ideas mature and not simply in in terms of what the design is but also in how you how you how are you going to communicate that idea how are you going to exchange that idea and allow it to uh, to grow and to become richer um, because if you, if you simply walk into a meeting and say, well, I had this idea last night, there it is, bang, take it or leave it. Mm. Um, uh, frankly, you, you, you deserve to be shot down for that and, and you probably will be. So um, the, the, the communication part and, and the processing, how you're going to communicate something is often as powerful or as important as the design part. I mean, dare I say it, there, there are many people who are, not brilliant designers, but brilliant communicators, and they do very, very well. Yeah, uh, yeah, re really, really insightful. I, I, I think, I think your point about time is so, is so true. And I, and I feel like ever since I've been working engineer, all I've heard from people is how we have less time than we always used to on these projects. Um, and so you've got to ask, where you know, have we passed the tipping point? Do we need to go back a few years to a point where we did have a bit more time to? to allow creative juices to flow, to understand the story, to be able to pull together the reasoning. Um, I want to move on to the, the final question I've got on my list, if that's right, with the three of you. Um, and then we should try and get through some of the Q&A that's been flying in thick and fast on the right-hand side of my screen. Um, I, so, so my day-to-day -day job at the moment, at the institution at least, is all around responding to the climate emergency, which I think many of us acknowledge now is one of the biggest you know, risks that we've ever faced as a, as a race. Um, as engineers and as architects and as people who work in the built environment, we often know that maybe you know the most impactful solution uh, might be to to not build. Will's Will's being um, cut off. <laughs> you 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 disappeared, Will, just at the most important point. But the I think, I think your question is going I to think be Donald Trump cut me off. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was it was just at the point of um, the, the the question of whether we build. Um, and I think that's a really, it's a really vital and really important one. I mean, the um, the structural awards didn't proceed this year, and I think that was uh, that was a sensible and, and right decision. But the some of the other awards um, managed to get in under the under the wire. The British Construction Industry Awards went ahead yesterday, and the commercial project of the year was awarded to One Finsbury Avenue, which was a, a 1980s uh, building in the City of London. Uh, designed by Peter Foggo and Arab Associates. And um, it's now uh, 40 years old. And uh, the temptation with that building, uh, as with so many other buildings of that era, um, must surely have been just to rip it down. 
And this building that won the commercial project of the year was given a complete new lease of life through a very uh, uh, through through strong client leadership with a very clear agenda for um, uh, re reducing and main the, the the carbon footprint of uh, retrofit first and of uh, s looking at the value of what's already there and building on that, making that better rather than um, the, the sort of throwaway culture. And uh, I, I dare say that those of us who've grown up through the through the 70s and 80s have grown up within a culture that is is about a throwaway. And that's something that we, we have to uh, each individually take uh, responsibility for and, and to reverse that. And that will that will flow through naturally into our uh, into our professional lives. Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, Romo or Elena, do either of you want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, on on the on the question of climate emergency <coughs> challenge and, and gaining uh, social proof or gaining consensus, I, I think is is the key. Uh, the data has been divisive for for a long time, and at the beginning of of the first lockdown. It, it, we were gaining momentum with protests around the world. People uh, are beginning to to accept that something is actually happening, and, and I think uh, persuasion here is important. Uh, that uh, that skill to persuade is so important. Um, so I uh, I agree with with Martin that each one of us has a, a role to play. As an educator, um, uh, I think all of us who are training future professionals, whether they are engineers, architects, or, or, or whoever, um, we, we, we ought to ensure that our, our narrative, our, um, our context is filled with, with the challenges, the, the future challenges, so that uh, not only we have uh, aware uh, engineers, but also engineers that are thinking constantly about uh, the problems, looking for solutions themselves, whilst they are learning. And so when they, they leave our classroom and enter the world, they are uh, professional uh, aware engineers who are solving those problems. So I, I think there is a, a role for all of us to play as educators, as individuals, as future engineers. Mm -hmm. Roma? Um, yeah, I've got a few points. And I think, again, I'm going to kind of take a, a, slight, a bit of a step back. I think, um, and, and this is not my original thinking, this is something that I've read somewhere. Um, but we have to change, so coming back to storytelling, we have to change the story. We're not trying to save the planet. We're trying to save ourselves because the planet will be fine. You know, we, we will wreak our destruction, humans will end up dying out, and then in 100,000 years, the planet's gonna be fine again. So I think there's, there's a change in narrative, like it's much easier to persuade someone to do something for themselves rather than for this kind of big, um, you know, concept that feels perhaps a little bit alien sometimes. So I think that's one way that we can change the story and the way we talk about this issue. And um, the second thing I wanted to say was that we need to look to communities around the world. Um, we need to acknowledge that the West are the biggest produ producers of carbon per capita. Um, it is really our economies that are responsible for the, you know, the outputs that are out there. Um, and there are communities around the world that have been doing, you know, living with nature, living with animals, doing all sorts of really organic things for thousands of years that we can learn from. So that requires kind of the humility of the West, as it were, to learn from the global South and also acknowledge that it is the global South that is ultimately the most vulnerable to the actions and, and the emissions that are happening in the West. And I'll just give you one tiny example, and please don't take this that I'm saying that this is a big overall criticism of the movement, but I remember when I saw Extinction Rebellion putting articles and call-outs for people to volunteer to be arrested in London during protests. And I thought to myself that bearded brown men and black men were not a part of that conversation mm. because these two groups would have never thought that arrest by police was a safe way for them to protest. Yeah, I know, I think that's a fair point. Um, I'm, I'm going, I'm going to, so I'm going to take all of that and I'm going to try and seamlessly merge it with some of the Q&A that's come in. Um, so we, we've sort of rushed through, uh, we've rushed through persuasion and 
you know, the, the differences between explaining it through technical reports versus storytelling versus trying to understand, uh, you know, the points of view of others, why it's necessary, who it affects, uh, the humility to be able to see in your own ideas, uh, you know, the weaknesses and the, the areas for improvement and to be able to sort of share objectives with others to try and, you know, build, build all of those uh, build all of those ideas together into something stronger. Um, one of the things that I, I think, Martin, you touched on working online, and we've had a question through about this, and I think that this kind of wraps it all together quite nicely. Um, the question is effectively, how do, how do you take creativity and a creative approach, take the, you know, the structural necessities of our jobs, and, and do all of that online? Because we're clearly going to be doing it for a while now. Do you have any thoughts as to how we do that in a, in a way that could be anywhere near as effective as in the office? Well, I think one of the things that's interesting is that this gives us the opportunity to reflect on on the efficiency of the office, actually. Um, and uh, I went back into uh, my studio um, during the previous lockdown um, and collected something. And I, I was looking around at, uh, at 24 desks and 24 seats and 48 monitors and nobody else in there. And the place was echoing with the lack of life. And it, it, it terrified me and I felt really awful. And then it, I, I felt completely transformed because I realized that my business was still working perfectly well. And um, not only that, people were working um, mm -hmm. in their spaces that they felt comfortable and happy and productive. And... I, I looked at these identical chairs and these identical desks and, and I thought, well, I don't have 24 identical people working for me. So how could this environment possibly have suited everyone equally uh, every day? And uh, as a wake up call to uh, recognizing that the, the environment we, we were working in, we were used to, uh, what may not necessarily have been the perfection we thought it was. That was really powerful. Mm. Um, it, it's the sort of, um, uh, the, the the frog in a in a boiling pan of water kind of uh, thing that, that just because you're used to it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be good for you. But that so that's not to give a, a an answer to the question. Um, I think the the answer is that we we have to really reflect on um, how we're working, what we're trying to achieve, um, because there are there are definitely new ways of working that will need to be formed and new ways of collaborating. Um, that will rely on us uh, working within this sort of uh, extraordinary camera-based, screen-based uh, technology. Um, but we can do that in a way that is, it is novel, but if we get used to it and, and if we can exploit it and build upon it, uh, then um, it, it, it will get better. And I think it'll be very, very powerful. But the, the thing is to, to recognize that um, what we had before was not necessarily perfection. The, the, the social aspect of that, we, we've got to work super hard at making sure that that remains or that, that, that is, uh, is, is retained because that's the glue that bonds us all together. But also to recognize that this new way of collaborating is um, still in its infancy. Uh, I, I was completely flustered uh, a few weeks ago to discover that the team's format on screen had changed. And then I realized it's because they're evolving it. They're trying to make it better. And uh, if we, we should all take that same attitude, I think. Yeah, so good, good, good answer. Um, I think, yeah, t taking advantage of the situation and seeing it as an opportunity and acknowledging that, like you say, that like that not everybody needs to work in an office five days a week with two monitors and the same high chair. Um, it doesn't work for everyone. And trying to make the most out of this situation, I think, is a good way to good way to frame it. One um, thing that I want to add to that, um, it, well, if you don't mind, is that, that yeah. there's a lot of um, articles and data and research being done, or particularly on the effect of women of working from home. And it's not good data because women still tend to do the majority of the housework, the majority of the childcare, the majority of the caring responsibilities. And working from home is showing to adversely affect women's mental health. And it, there's also data showing that women are spoken over more in conference calls online, or you know, people who are introverted will be less likely to put their hand up or say something. So 
while I totally agree that there are great opportunities in this, and I totally agree that the office doesn't suit everybody, we have to be very careful, especially in our industry, that the groups who, who are already in the minority don't get further marginalized. Yeah, I completely agree. And, and I've seen people do this poorly and, and well. I've, you know, there are, there are meetings I've been in where the, the view has always been, you put your hand up using the team's hand up function, and you wait your turn. And I mean, that, for me, that great leveler. It means that the chief exec has to wait for everyone else because they put their hand up forth. Um, and I think Martin's point was one of uh, recognizing that different people want different working environments, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. And if, uh, you know, like you say, it's not beneficial for everyone to work at home all the time. And um, yeah, I, I think learning how to deal with that flexibility is, is definitely something we need to take forward. Will, if, if you don't mind, in the world of education, um, it's, it's challenging because, of course, um, not we ought to consider uh, that the impact of, of, of social justice, not everyone has technology available to them. And uh, that, that is beginning to, to, to be more noticeable in, in the world of education. You are trying to educate uh, not only through, through this, this methodology, which actually works very well. I, I was just listening to, to Martin, Martin and Roma and, and indeed yourself, and I'm thinking, Right now, I'm learning, uh, and that's what education is, learning. And I'm learning from, from all of you. I'm learning from the questions you are, you are posing. So that, that, that's fine. Uh, Hands-on learning is a bit more troubling, but we'll get there as well. Uh, the problem is, what happens if you don't have access to the tools? And then you, as, as Roma uh, has highlighted throughout her conversation today, you then uh, marginalize people who are already uh, at, the, at the fringes of, of, the, of education or work or, or, or other circumstances. And that, that is something very serious and we need to together find a way forward. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I have to take note of the time. We have two minutes left and I've completely failed in my role as a chair to try and get anywhere near answering the 14 very good questions on my screen. I think we might have done one and we, we, we started to touch on teaching and the influence on that of teaching online so maybe we can say we've ticked off one and a half i'd like if you don't mind to try and just hit a third question so i'm going to put this to each of you because somebody's asking for top three tips and given that there's three of you that would be quite a nice way to finish wouldn't it so uh, i wonder if each of us could think what's your top one tip for creating a positive environment in the workplace where people challenge each other in a beneficial way i don't know who wants to go first but i'm going to leave it to you to it over when you find, okay, I'll, I'll go first uh, and see if, if, I, if I capture the, the question. Top three tips to uh, enable a, a, a place, uh, a workplace where you can challenge each other. Uh, I, I think uh, I, want to, I want to, it's a cop out because I think what Roma said is very important, humility. Uh, so listening, uh, listening, accepting uh, critical feedback, uh, and, and certainly, uh, what I always say to every single member of staff who joins and might, uh, here you have permission to make mistakes. Not only, uh, not only you are allowed to make mistakes, you have permission to make mistakes as long as you learn from them. So the, uh, just providing a safe environment for people to make mistakes and being humble about it, uh, I think it's, it's, a, it's a powerful tool. Empathy. Fantastic. Thank you. Roma, what's your top? Well, Elena has stolen my answer, so you're in trouble now. <laughs> what would be your number two? <laughs> I think maybe just to add even more specifically to what Elena said, I think that needs to come from leadership because I think, again, too, for too long, the focus has been on um, those of us in a minority to speak up when we see something that is not right. Um, only to be shot down most of the times, um, again, speaking from personal experiences. But if the leadership shows that that kind of behavior is not acceptable mm -hmm. and what kind of behavior is acceptable, um, then then you've got a winner. Like right now, I absolutely would work for Elena or for Martin, had, you know, wouldn't have to think about it twice. Come, come, Roma. <laughs> and by the way, uh, he's not going to show you the book. Thank you, my book. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, t top down, de definitely. Absolutely agree with that. Martin, what's your, your top tip? Um, I, I, I genuinely have nothing to add to that. I, I think um, e empathy is the most powerful thing that as designers we can bring to any conversation. 
and strong uh, leadership uh, can actually be very quiet leadership as well. Um, but but it needs to uh, embrace everyone and to give everyone the the opportunity to shine. Fantastic. Okay, so we have humility, empathy, and and coming from the top. I think that's a nice. A, a nice three points to, to finish the session on. So, so um, not to make this too political, but maybe l let's look at Jacinda Arden. I think there's a lot to learn from her. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So um, I, I want to, I, I mean, I should say thank you firstly to the three of you for giving up your, your morning to, to come and give us your thoughts. I mean, I, I think the fact that we didn't manage to squeeze in enough questions at the end just shows how much you all have to share. And I think most of the audience would agree that if we were to keep going for another hour, we probably wouldn't find we really lost anyone. Um, but I appreciate that you're probably all too busy to do that. So I, I, I'll try and wrap up the session briefly. Um, I think it's you know, really good to hear about, uh, like you say, humility and empathy and using those to create an environment around us where people are allowed to put their ideas forward. I think encouraging others to persuade is you know, surely as important as learning how to persuade ourselves and how to be better persuaders because we're all surrounded by a team at the end of the day and it's you know it's only going to get you so far if you're very good at arguing your point um clearly we we all know the reason we work in teams on these on these big projects is because it takes that that width of ideas and that diversity of opinions so trying to harness everybody else's opinions i think i think if that's the one message that's come across in the last hour it's about that it's about harnessing the group's views trying to understand it trying to help people open with their ideas um, and trying to take that towards something with a with a common goal for the benefit benefit of everyone. Um, so thank you to the three of you for for joining me this morning. I feel quite humbled to be in the presence of you all, and I feel like I maybe added very little in addition to the three of you. But that's that's why you're here.